Hi and good morning. Today I want to start a series on basically the fundamentals of motor control. And I'm going to start out with the topic I worked on last because it's still like most present in my head. And that is resolvers. Now resolvers are used in synchronous motors because the motor controller needs to know the absolute angle like where, where the rotor magnetic field currently points at because it needs to generate a field that's sort of 90 degrees off that from it or less if you go into field weakening. Um, so for that reason you cannot use incremental encoders because they just give you a relative position like in velocity information. So resolvers, how do they work? That's what Wikipedia thinks how they work. Um, they say <coughs> there's an excited rotor in the middle and then there's um, stator coils um, arranged in like a 90 degree offset to that and they generate a phase shifted signal as we can see down here in the bottom and from comparing sort of the amplitudes of the sine and cosine signal we can then compute back the, the absolute rotor position and it's a pretty simple mathematical exercise, it's only on the German Wikipedia page. Uh, so once you've measured the two amplitudes you <coughs> use the arcus tangens function to get the angle. And that's not actually correct because if you were go out to use arcus tangens A1 over A2 um, you may know from school that arcus tangens is like 90 degree periodic so you wouldn't really know where the rotor currently is. But there is an arcus tangus function that takes two arguments and that actually goes from 0 to 360 degrees. We will see that when we look at the code. Okay, so this is what Wikipedia says a resolver looks, and there might be resolvers that actually look like that. In practice what I've seen is they rather look like this. You have both excitation and receiver coils um, in a circle and then you have a sinusoidally shaped rotor that uh, yeah, acts as a transformer core, variable transformer core between the primary and secondary windings. Okay, so what we obviously need to do is generate this sine wave for the rotor or for the excitation. It's called excitation because it's not actually on the rotor. The excitation sine wave. So that's typically um, at a couple of kilohertz. And now there is specialized chips out there. They're quite expensive and they need quite a lot of board space. And they generate this excitation signal send it through an amplifier and then read back the secondary binding sine and cosine signal and then you can read the angle in various formats there's parallel data and SPI data or they can simulate uh, an incremental encoder which is a bit stupid but anyway they can and yeah I wanted to get around these expensive chips and save some board space. So I thought let's do this differently. Let's have our little STM32 generate the sine wave. But I figured it uh, there is no duck in there that we can use. So we have to use other means of generating the sine wave. And it's important that the STM generates the sine wave itself. Like we cannot have a sine wave generator I know com comprised of an op amp that uh, sort of generates the sine wave as a background task because we need to exactly synchronize. Like this is the peak of our excitation sine wave and then after some delay we need to read um, our secondary winding feedback signal. And it has to be a fixed delay so we have to know where the peak of the resolver sine wave is, uh, the exciter sine wave is 
to be able to read the feedback at the right instance. Um, Okay, so the STM32 is not able to generate a sine wave, generate a sine wave directly, but what it can generate quite easily is a square wave. And that's what we can see right here. A square wave at a given frequency, and it happens to be half the PWM frequency, because within the PWM interrupt routine we just toggle a pin up and down. Now to generate a sine wave from the square wave. Um, we just go on the internet and we will find this circuit right here. It's a simple 3-pole low-pass filter. Let's have a look at what it does. Sorry, it's the only means of having you see my mouse. Um, so we start out with the green sine wave right here and then after the first stage it looks like this, after the second stage it looks like this, becoming pretty sinusoidal, and after the third stage it's actually sinusoidal. Now the amplitude has suffered quite a bit, um, only 0.3 volts left, but for the resolver we need more like 10 volts, 9 volts peak to peak. Simple reason being, if you go back at the picture, uh, we have a transformer here and it happens to have like roughly a 1 to 3 ratio between uh, primary and secondary winding. So if we have 9 volts peak to peak on the primary, we have 3 volts peak to peak on the secondary feedback coils. And 3 volts is of course perfect for our ADC because that has a dyna dynamic range of 0 to 3.3 volts. Yes, so 10 volts or 9 volts what we want, and that's why we are using an amplifier. Come on, show my mouse. Okay. This amplifier right here, I'm simulating an LM386 here. In the actual circuit I've moved on to a different model, but that's not really relevant right now. So, here you go, amplifier amplifies, and we get a nice big sine wave. And that um, is uh, through an output uh, DC decoupling uh, is being fed to our exciter coil. Okay, whoops. So that's the basics of generating our excitation sine wave. Um, so now all we need to do is read the secondary winding signal. Hmm. So basically what happens, I've, I've, saw, I've seen a nice drawing on the Cole Morgan website. Um, so on the top here, that's our excitation sine wave. Come on, let me select. Ah, okay. So <laughs> on the top here, that's our excitation. And then as we spin the motor, we get like a a, how a curve, like the way the excitation is being, um, let's take a step back, I said the, the transfer ratio of our transformer is 1 to 3, and that's not exactly true, it's variable, it's up to 1 to 3, but it can also be 1 to infinity, and that's, um, down here. Too bad you can't see my mouse. Where it says 90 degrees, that's where the transfer ratio is infinity. And then up here at 180 degrees is where the transfer ratio is 1 to 3. Um, so what we need to do is measure the feedback when the sine wave here reaches its peak. There's no use reading it um, yes, somewhere else because then we don't get the actual hull curve here, modulation curve. So what we need to know is what is the phase shift between our first signal here, that one, and our feedback signal. Like if you generate a rising edge here, when does it show up on the feedback signal? 
and I've I haven't done any math on that, I just took my scope and measured uh, here and then measured at the feedback signal and it turned out at um, at 8.8 .8 kilohertz it was uh, 100, no, I think 90 microseconds or in other words if we count from the falling edge it was 40 microseconds and likewise um, at 8.8 uh, .8 kilohertz it's 20 microseconds from the falling edge and that's an important piece of information as we can see in a minute um, so first let's uh, take a look at a scope shot I took earlier um, so this is the feedback from our resolver and in this video I, I do spin the rotor and we can see the the amplitude vary as I spin. Yes, here we go. Now, um, let's have a look at the code. So, ST, I've got to say, have done a brilliant, brilliant job on their ADC. Um, because what it currently does in the firmware is it, it runs as sort of a, a software independent background task. It reads all the various input channels like currents, voltages, throttle input and puts them in memory. That's called DMA. In addition to that you can say, um, dear ADC, I have a higher priority task for you now. I need to read the resolver. And that's what in ADC's, uh, what in ST's nomenclature is called an injected ADC conversion. So while it's doing the background task of uh, doing the regular current and voltage uh, reading, you can interrupt that and do some more high priority ADC reading. So what I'm here, uh, doing here is our our secondary windings are connected to ADC channel 6 and 7 and since we can have up to four injected channels um, I'm reading both of them twice to further improve the signal to noise ratio um, and then we say we trigger this injected conversion by software by running a bit in the register uh, and now comes the next genius bit of kit from ST, you can trigger the injected conversion by using a timer. So we set up a timer. It runs at 1 MHz to give us an easy 1 microsecond resolution. And, well, it's pretty simple I.O. setup. We set up our um, this pin GPIO D2, generates uh, the square wave. The green one down here and GPIO A6 and 7 read back the feedback and they are put into analog mode. Okay, so now <coughs> we do start a conversion and why do we do that? Um, basically when there's no excitation going on our uh, feedback signals float around 1.6 volt, so in the, the middle of the ADC's dynamic range. And those 1.6 volts are generated with a simple uh, resistor divider network and of course that has some tolerances. So we we measure the, the offset. There's no excitation going on, though everything is like in steady state. And Yes, we can measure the zero point, basically. So we start one conversion by software, that's why we set it up to use the software trigger. And when that conversion is done, we read channel 6 and 7 um, and use another nice bit of kit that ST provides the offset registers. So basically you can program an offset for each of the four injected channels and then the ADC automatically subtracts that um, from the ADC result. 
and then you get a nice signed um, result from minus something to plus something nice and um, symmetric okay next uh, thing we do is we change the trigger from manual or from software interaction to the timer so now whenever the timer fires on channel 4 the ADC starts to do its conversion so that's the setup done so let's see what we do day by day when we are running our PWM loop so we have a state variable there's two states one uh, where we generate the falling edge and set up our timer and then one where we generate the rising edge and read our ADC. So here we generate the falling edge and then uh, we set the sample delay. So in, in case of 8.8 .8, uh, kHz PWM frequency this would be 40 microseconds and for 17.6 kilohertz it would be 20 microseconds and yeah we sort of set up the counter to to generate an event after 20 microseconds which then uh, automatically triggers the ADC injected conversion okay so next time we come back into here and the state variable is toggled so we go into this section down here generate a rising edge and now we read our cosine signal from injected channels 1 and 2 and the sine channel uh, the sine signal from injected channels 3 and 4 and now we use our arcus tangens 2 function which takes two arguments and returns our absolute rotor angle between 0 and 360 degrees in fact, for a higher resolution, we do use 0 to 655 and 355, like 2 to the power of 16 <laughs> um, digit, digits. And actually, that's all I to it. That's all I can say. We can take a look at the hardware, taking a picture of it. So. We can see, let's go into the crop mode, so you can actually see what I'm talking about. So we have our three pole uh, low pass filter right here. Then we have uh, the DC decoupling and the excitation amplifier, which is a simple, cheap, 30 year old generic audio amplifier. It's nothing special, it's an audio amplifier. <coughs> And that, like I said, generates our like 9 volt peak to peak voltage. And then down here, we generate the roughly 10 volts to power the amplifier. And then here, C41 is our DC decoupling capacitor. And the part cost uh, of, of that stuff is like 50 cents. It's, it's really nothing because <coughs> all the exciting stuff now happens in software. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's all there is to it. That's how simple it actually is to, to read a resolver without specialized chips. Um, I hope you liked that kind of like in-depth video. If you do, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, would you like to see more of that, what would you like to see discussed next. A lot of exciting topics um, for the nerd <laughs> that uh, we can talk about in, in the surroundings of motor control. Okay, thanks for watching and see you next time, bye bye.